And I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Lisa Kemmerer. She is a philosopher, activist, artist, nature adventurer, and a professor at Montana State University in Billings. Dr. Kemmerer is the founder of Tapestry, Women's Institute of Integrated Justice. She is an award-winning author of nine books, many of which the beautiful covers are up there on the screen. You can take a look. One of my favorites, the way that I discovered her, was Sister Species. She also wrote Eating Earth, Animals and World Religions, and many more. She's published more than 100 articles, and she's an internationally known speaker on intersectional justice and animal ethics. Let's welcome Dr. Lisa Kemmerer. So, all right, thank you. And thank you, Jasmine. I loved it, that was fantastic. I really appreciate what you bring to the table, and thank you, Charlotte, for the introduction. And I think I have a special thank you here <laughs> for all of you in Thrive on Plants. And I think you're all hanging out up here. Yeah, raise your hands. Everybody who did something to put this together. Hands up, please. Woo! Woo! Yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. It, it is greatly appreciated. And you know, as vegan events go, this is, you, you did well. You got the word out. The posters were good. Yeah, you did well. Congratulations, it's, it's hard to, especially when it snows and ices on your, on your parade. All right, so let's see, there's a, first, there's a few things I want to mention first. So, and this is something, oh, I'm old in the vegan movement. I mean, I'm really old in the vegan movement, which is, you know, you should, it's, it's kind of a nice thing, but it's also kind of weird how young everybody is in this movement. But there's some things that I'm learning as I go, and in some ways the young folks are so far ahead of me. Like this new sexuality thing that's like 80 different sexualities, and there's, I mean, there's just all this stuff going on that I'm trying to keep up with. It's fantastic. I love it. But so um, as I add the layers of knowledge and try to adjust to what's going on in the world around me, these are some of the things that I've added. So it's really important to mention that. And this, I hope to share with you all. If you ever speak, don't forget we're from the United States. We're like this giant island that goes out into the world and speaks like we're the only thing that exists. And so it's really good to say, I'm from the United States. This is a United States perspective. That, that's my worldview and my world, so that we're not you know, discounting anybody else. As for the binaries, I'm going to talk about male and female. I get it doesn't work, but for the sake of language, um, I've realized it would be really good if I could transform my language and erase them all. But all I can say is wait till you're you know, 30 years older and then try to remove and or the from your language and see how that works. It's just not that easily done, but I, I get that it's a really good thing. So I say that I get that binaries aren't a good thing, but for the sake of communication, I will be using them. When I spoke in England, it was, it was hilarious because they had completely removed she and he and they were using them and they. And I'm like, that's not proper English, but okay. <laughs> I can do that, it's just gonna take some time. I don't use the term intersectional, and I actually have an article on this. It's in Green Theory and Praxis. And the reason I don't use intersectional is just, it has to do with uh, where it came from, right? It's from black legal scholars. And there are some folks who say it's appropriation, stop stealing our word. Um, so fine. It's like there's lots of words out there. I'll find another one. So I have. So I use usually overlapping or just something different so that, you know, honoring the fact that that's from a different tradition. And uh, so I don't use it. Um, and the final thing is that I'm focusing, I was asked to focus on speciesism and sexism, but again, honoring the fact that these oppressions are linked and that these are not the only oppressions that are out there, and I'm not saying that men are not oppressed, um, but the oppressions are certainly different. And just to let you know that I am focusing on sexism, although I will mention some of the others as I go along. Another thing I tend to do, I use it more writing than speaking, I use the term animal. And it's because I do not like it when people use animal as if we weren't animals. Anybody in here not an animal? <laughs> all right, so we're all animals. So let's not <laughs> pretend we're not. Let's use a language that's honest about who we are. We're animals. So when I use animal, it's a combination of any and animal, and it's any animal other than the species of the speaker. So a, a chimpanzee can sign animal, and it's like everything except chimps. And you could, you know, a parrot could say animal, and it'd be you know, everything but parrots. 
So we can use animal, and we're recognizing that this is a term where we can talk about every species other than our own. And I don't like the other options that are out there because as an author, they're really cumbersome. I don't want to write non-human animals or other than human animals every time. Because um, that's all I talk about is, you know, this, the species is so, and the differences and the connections and interconnections. So it's, it's too cumbersome. So that's what I've done and why I do it. So if you see that term written, that's why it's up there. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad to hear it. It's, thank you. It is something, by the way, I started using when I was a little kid. I got as a kid that I didn't want to use animal wrong and, and, and other and pretend I wasn't. When my parents told me I was an animal, I couldn't understand why it was happening like that. So that's an old term, even if I'm the only one who knew it. <laughs> so I want to say, too, that there's lots of ways to understand interconnections. All right, so this is just, hello, there's lots of philosophies of interconnection. The one I'm focusing on for this talk is ecofeminism. Uh, I really love to talk about the Eastern philosophies. And again, if you're in the black uh, community and you want to use intersectionality, there's some great studies out there that have sh shown what that term's all about and why it's important. Um, but for today, we're going to look at ecofeminism. All right, so starting from the point, I remember when I first gave a talk at Stony Brook in New York, I don't know, it was a fairly new scholar. And uh, I caught on pretty quick that the feminists were not happy to have an animal uh, liberationist show up at their feminist talk and say, you know, we need to quit eating dairy and eggs. And they're all like, get out of here. We're talking about women's issues. We don't want to talk about animals. And I caught on really quick that the feminists were not interested in animal liberation. So I, I couldn't understand that. What is that about? So that was my first spark of interest in how to, to build bridges and really understand these connections. And ecofeminism, this is the person who coined the term, it's not that old, right? It's from the 70s. Anything having to do with feminism is fairly young just because it's been oppressed for so long. And so it's a new theory. It's, you know, it's, it's still changing. It's not, it's not set to one thing, which is a good thing. Um, and it is a theory, as in it's something that's put out there and you demonstrate it's like gravity. You know, you can say, look, if I throw up a pencil, it falls on the floor. Here's why, right? So it, it, theories are something that explains something that happens, but you can't necessarily prove them. If somebody wants to say, no, that's not why the pencil falls, I'll give you several other reasons why that pencil's falling, right? So that's what a theory is. So ecofeminist theory, I think, is really important for understanding this, uh, these ideas. Ecofeminism is a theory that shows why the denigration and the exploitation of women and the natural world, and I added animals, uh, they focus on nature in the theory, but it's, it has been expanded. They are linked. So I'm going to use this theory. Uh, with this behind me, I'm going to talk about how we could, we could show these interconnections. All right, so I'm going to use worldview, language, and some examples of parallel oppressions in, hope, in the hope of giving some grounding for understanding some of these interconnections. All right, that's the hope, that's the plan. Here's what I think is probably the most important idea in ecofeminism that helps us understand interlocking or overlapping oppressions. All right, so the idea here is that everything has dualities. So uh, male and female and white and black and, uh, old and young, and we all know that it's not really the case. You know, the, the binary sex and gender stuff is just one picture of how we're starting to see it isn't true. There's no black and white. We all come out of Africa. Uh, you know, the oldest skeletons are from there. That's where our ancestry is from. Um, mind and body, well, that would be interesting. I mean, how, there must be some connection because when my brain thinks, my arms waggle around, so clearly they're not completely disconnected or separate. So these things aren't complete dualistic opposites. So they are false, they are wrong, um, but they, have, they are valued. So anything that we see on the one side is good, on the other side we devalue it. And when we devalue it, we create a hierarchy, so some things are better than others. And then the things on the A side become the, the superior things and they end up exploiting the things on the not A side. So this is a really important thing to recognize from our culture. We all do this, everything's a binary. Right? We don't, if, you, if you know anything about Indian philosophy, they don't have this. They have this idea of and with, that there's, everything's a gray area. There's this idea of anekantavada, for example, where it's just your point of view, whether or not the glass is half empty or half full, and it's all in your perspective. It has nothing to do with the glass. 
So, but this is not how we view the world. We're very black and white is the term that we use. Um, but right, even that we know that black and white has to do with which rays are bouncing back. It, has, it, it isn't how we envision it. All right, so I included the picture at the top because notice that whenever you see an evolutionary scale, what does it culminate in? Humans? What kind of humans? Males. What kind of males? Yes. <laughs> White, right? Look at the features. And so even when you're making fun of it down there in the lower left, look at the features. It's always a man. It's always a white man. This is the ideal. This is, what's, this is the A. This is what is viewed as the best. So in the hierarchy, that is what is used as a model. And I included that little blue medical thing there, right? And we're starting to figure out that the reason women's heart attacks, we had trouble figuring out how to treat we were in, women had heart attacks, because the male model, their symptoms are different. Right, so it's just one example of how using this model of, of the body, of what is human, has caused problems, has created deficiencies, and, and the medical system is just one of the areas. So um, women are devalued as all the things on the right. They're viewed as not mine, they're not rational, um, they're cl less close to God, they're more passionate, they're more emotional, they're closer to nature. So right, you see how all those things on the not A side are the things that are associated with being a female. And they are the lesser, and they are denigrated, and it puts you in a position of being exploitable. All right, so, um, the thing is, too, that they're, they're interconnected. It isn't just that you're on the not A side. Again, it's that all those things, to be female is to have all those other characteristics. And again, to be a pig is to have all those other characteristics. So sexism and speciesism, here you see how ecofeminism gets that they're interconnected. There they are, they're both not A, so they're both going to be all those things which are not valued, which are not viewed as ideal. So this is where ecofeminism, I think, is brilliant and very helpful to us in understanding interconnected oppressions. If you take a model of not A's and start to look at it, so if you start with someone who is not male and you move around to not being white, so we have an indigenous person, and then as you keep moving around to the knots, then the animals are viewed as not rational. Of course, women are not rational as well, and uh, people of color are viewed as even less civilized and less rational. And you keep moving around to being not controlled and not civilized, you get to nature, uh, other animals, uh, coming into mind, not mind, not heaven, and again, you're back to not male. So showing you how this, this how these are interconnected, and how on the scale of things you can see where the different oppressed beings will be located on the not A side. Seen ads like this ever? My guess is you have and you haven't noticed it. If you look, you will see ads that connect speciesism and sexism. You will have the sexualized animal uh, and the uh, animalized woman. So again here, you have the female human, she's viewed as irrational, emotional, she's more of nature and animals than she is of man who is of spirit and God and reason. And again, with the, with the cow there, it's, it's one lesser because not human at all. The cow is an animal and not a human. And when you get to people, <coughs> sorry, people of color, <coughs> you see that again you have the co combined not A's uncivilized, animalian, wild, uncontrolled, emotive, irrational. So look at this ad. Right? Is that offensive? I think that's so offensive. And it's not uncommon, these kind of ads. Uh, people, we aren't aware of what's going on here, how she is being animalized, uh, viewed as wild, uncivilized, untamed. And here's some more examples, and notice the feline tendencies here on all three, the previous slide as well as this one. Not white, not human, not civilized, not male. <clears throat> oh, and I put a red arrow there so that I couldn't possibly, thank you much, so that I couldn't possibly forget I put the arrow. Notice how the word men is there, right? But can you see that that's a positive use, right? Men can be beasts, they can be animals, and it's a good thing, right? They're not irrational because of it, they're strong because of it. Uh, they're not part of nature because of it, they conquer nature because of it. 
So it, it is fascinating how anything associated with male has a positive spin in our culture, even if it's the same thing that's used to denigrate women. Pretty good trick we got going on there. Capitalism. This is one of the things that, uh, that I want to do some more work on that not many people are looking at. In fact, I don't know anybody else who's really looking at capitalism and its role here in these uh, joint oppressions. So ownership is of the means of production is what capitalism is, and you use them for profit. Now, this is really important for this hierarchy of exploitation, of denigration and exploitation. So if you want to exploit someone, they're going to need to be abled, right? You can get more out of them. If you're going to exploit them for their womb, you're going to need them to be young. And if you're going to try to get them, for instance, we have if you want to marry a woman to have sons, which was traditionally what was done so that men could pass their property to their sons, she's going to need to be hetero and cisgender. Right? So you see how all these things are normalized by the male view of hierarchy and oppression. These are the ideals. These are what has to be brought to bear on women. They're going to need to be able, they're going to need to be young and fertile, and they're going to have to be willing to settle in with a man. Now, as you keep going around, you get to the not male and the not mind, and you see the cow there, again, exploited for reproduction. They need to be abled, they need to be young, and they need to be uh, able to carry calves. So, uh, and the ranch that I walk on, I know that if a cow doesn't take or isn't fertile or won't bear young, she's out of there. She's off to slaughter early. She's there for a purpose, and it has to do with her reproduction and her ability uh, to carry offspring. So production and reproduction and how capitalism shapes what it, the exploitation of both women and animals, other beings as well. So again, equal feminism has nature on that not a side. So there is an indif indifference to nature. Nature is something like women there to be exploited. You want a tree? It's a resource. Go get it. It's not a tree. It's a resource. And I can ask my students in class. If I put up there trees, water, um, I don't know, what else would I put? Land, fields, they're not going to say nature. They'll say resources. When I ask them, what are these? They're resources. They're there for us to exploit. They have a purpose. The purpose is not their own purpose. The purpose is our purpose. So here you see a dairy, and dairy is the uh, form of animal ag that is most damaging to the natural world. So here you see the exploitation of females for production and reproduction and the, an indifference to nature and what happens to nature when we exploit animals, animals for production and reproduction. And of course, um, for those of you doing reading, you also know that these uh, big ag, the people who work there are poor and disempowered. Many of them don't speak English and they don't have med proper medical care, they can't, look, they can't stand up for themselves if they're exploited by an industry. So you, you can see here, oh, and our health too is destroyed. Um, as Jasmine's pointed out, this stuff is deadly for us. So if someone's making a profit and everything else is harmed by that. And so this is where the, on the A side, they're the ones who are property owning and who are getting the benefits. All right, moving on to language, the second thing I said I would talk about. Feminizing and sexualizing of nature. So on the not a side, you're going to see that they're associated with each other, denigrated, and this leads on to exploitation. All right, so let's look at, at nature here. Look at these words. Mother nature. Fertile land. Fertile land, let's rape the land. It's a virgin forest. Rape the land. Plow the fields. And of course, some of you know the euphemism for deflowering, right? Harvest and versus withering on the vine. I remember a guy that told me I was withering on the vine once. <laughs> I think he caught on how happy I was about that. Eventually, it took him some time. All right, so and the last one here I've put in red husbandry. We're going to do one more look at that one. Um, notice to don't frack your mother. Now, one of the things I really notice, uh, it's, it's a little less now. But the word fuck became like every other word in a sentence for like a year or two there. I think it's fading out now, am I right? Again, it's a young person thing, it's just as bad now. Be really clear, 
this word is violence against women. Right? Stop doing it. Wow. If you want to use a word that's blasphemy or whatever you want to call it, or, or I don't know what the word is, something flat. Use English. There's also so many words out there. Don't slam on women. Because fuck is a violence against women. And it takes something that should be beautiful and it turns it into something forced and violent and ugly. Okay, can we stop doing that, please? <laughs> All right, husbandry. This one is particularly delightful, right? Because when you think about who does husbandry, it's the ranchers, I see. It's the farmers, right? And what are they doing husbandry with the land and the animals? And what does it mean? It means that they dominate and control them, they manipulate them, they exploit them, and they're done with them, they throw them out, they kill them, right? So what does this mean about husbands? <laughs> Hey, whatever. <laughs> All right, so husbandry, right? Care, cultivation, breeding. These are definitions out of, that I got from a dictionary. So this is what it means. So it basically means to manipulate and control someone else for your purposes. And I love these pictures, right? Here's manipulating, controlling an animal and a woman. He's like, oh, you're doing so well, honey. Keep cooking for me. You stay right here and do all the work. I'll go out and enjoy life. And when I come home, you'll have everything just ready for me. It's perfect. All right, more language stuff. When I put the word bitch in the computer, I, the, the first picture that popped up was the gals by the car. Now, a bitch is the dog, right? The female dog is a bitch. So why, de so it's female, so we know it's gonna be, we don't have to ask why. It's female, um, it's an animal, it's gonna be negative. So applying that to a woman, right? It has all the stuff on the naughty side. Um, and notice the, I purposely put up there the Native American, African American descent. So right here we have again the person of color, uh, animalized, uh, sexualized. Now, the words that I've put in the middle there, so the first three are green. They have to do with kind of canine types. The blue ones, what are they? Feline types. What are the ones on the right? Yep, they're farmed animals. So notice how many of them apply, right? Look at how many farmed animals. And there's a lot more. This was just a random sampling of how women and animals, and especially farmed animals, because they're so, you know, they're not, wild animals have a measure of prestige compared to a cow, right? The cow is just dumb and docile and exploited and basically nothing to anyone uh, in the common, in our common worldview. I put a few man ones down there in the lower right, lest we forget that these can be applied to men too, but what do you notice about it? What if I called someone a stud? Would you rather be a bitch or a stud? Right? A, a pig or a cow or a stud? Right? Or a beast? You dog you? Right. How negative is that? Right? So we can see again how when, the, when they're used on a man, they have that positive spin. Anything touched by male in our culture has to be a good thing. This is, this is such a fascinating thing. This is Marty Keel, Marty Keel's work, who, who first looked at hunting. Yeah, yay Marty. So she looked at hunting language, and she does something a little different, and uh, she's gone now, so I can't ask her, you know, what does she think of it, but I've kind of built on the stuff that she started to do. Notice how the language demeans and objectifies. We talk about them, if, if you've ever, how many of you have challenged a hunter before? Okay, so you know they're apt to say things that, you know, like, like they don't even get why. They're doing it for the deer. Oh, they're gonna starve, I'm out here, I'm so good to them. You know, and it's a mercy killing. Um, I'm not just harvesting them, there's gonna be too many. It's like I'm going out to pick a berry. Um, or they'll be, or if they're gonna go out to kill a bear, they're like, God, they're dangerous, you know, they're a beast. You know, and they go out there and they got their camo on and they're there. You know, they look like they're in a war. It's insane. You know, if the bear sees them, the bear's out of there as fast as they can get out of there. They're terrified. So they're trying to present something here that simply is not real for what's actually happening in the words. In the real world out there. So and little girls can go out with a gun. And these animals are docile. They're so easy to kill. So you talk about something like fair chase. Can we be honest with our words? Like, what is fair, right? You've got a duck and then a man with a giant gun who's going out. The duck's just trying to have breakfast and coast around on the water. doesn't even know what's going on. It's like, if it was fair, 
you wouldn't find many hundreds. I don't think you'd find any hundreds out there. They're only out there because they know it's not fair. So words that I suggest, and this is from Eating Earth, the book that talks about this stuff. Um, ambush, massacre, assassination, look at those definitions. Right? That's what hunting is. Using language honestly. Calling people on their crap. Another way to put it. All right, so. Um, also, the other thing about hunters is, and this is Marty Keels. This is just fantastic stuff that she came up with. So she, it, so the first one, not so much. But I noticed that if I ask students, they'll say they're going to be intimate with nature. Good God, is that what you think of intimacy? <laughs> And the guns are, of course, phallic. The bullets are called balls. And a premature discharge is when you shoot. You get a little overexcited and shoot beforehand. And when you hit, it's called penetration. Right? So this sexualized language. And the orgasmic experience, when, when I was, was first started teaching at MSUB in Billings, um, I was invited in by, she said, go ahead, have a go at my environmental students. And I did, and, and it was great. I had a debate with one of the students there. And, he, he changed his diet in the end, but he was honest. He was honest. He, I, I said, so why do you hunt? And he said, it's an orgasmic experience. He said, there's nothing else like it. I said, sex? Whatever. <laughs> 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 All right, so the third, just examples. And this stuff is so fun. And this, this stuff is, I'm indebted to Carol Adams, who's the one who really started this stuff. Notice how this is bimbo wraps, right? So anything bimbo is going to be female because we're, you know, we're not very smart, we're not, we're not intellect, we're more of nature. We're not about our minds, we're about our bodies because we're there for men, so our bodies are what matter. And we're just like the pig. The pig's body is there for people, right? It's there to be eaten. The pig doesn't have a brain, the pig is just a body. So we start to see how, the object how women and animals are both objectified that the animals are feminized and sexualized just as women are animalized and sexualized. That's a great example of it. I just found that one last night. I was so pleased. Look at that pig smile. Please eat me. <laughs> Here's another example. And the, one in the, uh, the red one in the corner is on Carol Adams, one of her books, at least. So objectifying women and animals and exploiting for exploitation. So you have to turn them into nothings if you're going to eat them or if you're going to abuse women too, you have to make them lesser. You have to make them not of reason. You have to make them matter less if you're going to treat them as lesser. So you can see here how the cuts of meat have been applied to all of the not A's, all of the lessers. And I wanted to point out that this word livestock, which I never let people get away with using, it's like stock sitting on a shelf waiting to get eaten, living stock standing out in the pasture waiting to go in there and get killed. No, they're beings, they're individuals, they're not livestock, they're not here for us to eat. And it's very similar, I know my mom, when I was a kid at least, was Mrs. Walter, my dad's name, Kemmerer. So Mrs., my dad's name. She just disappeared. She became the Mrs. of my dad. And, and so it's the same thing. You're not here on your own. You're just here for the man. You're, you're all about someone else. So again, noticing how language objectifies us and makes us disappear and become here for the other. Here are some fantastic examples. You can find these easily online of feminizing and sexualizing both animals and women. Look at the duck in the pose there of, I don't know what that pose is. It's like, I'm a dead duck, but I'm all about sex. <laughs> Just bizarre. On this one, I notice the blue arrow. So notice if you can read it, healthy skin has scratches. Is that right? I can't see very well. Healthy skin, less scratches, and cellulitis. So this is a, an, a who is this product for? Right? Who's, it's, is it for chickens? No, it's for women. And there's a chicken showing off her leg. And how many ways is this gross? <laughs> and the other one's even worse. Easy pickup from pan to platter, it says. Turkey hooker. Right? And the hook goes up what's called a quackula, if you actually know anything about birds. Easy pickup, right? Up the quackula, you see the arrow there. Easy pickup, 
rape the dead turkey for eating with this implement for carrying to the table. Lovely. This is a real KFC ad. If you only want your breasts, legs, and thighs, send in the KFC. You know, for somebody who's not paying attention, it would almost seem feminist in the mainstream. So I found these two images of the sexualized, feminized pigs ready for eating. I mean, the, right, the, it's just so bizarre. It's just so bizarre. So these overlapping oppressions, um, I want to add capitalism as a really important element of this. But we've got classism, ageism, heterosexism, you know, ableism, they're all connected with the fact that the not A's are here for the A's. They're here to be exploited. So the things that those of us who are vegans and care about animals, uh, the sexism and speciesism together, this is some work that I did with some actual math, checking out to see um, who suffers more and why. And indeed, the female animals suffer longer, and they suffer harder. They suffer harder because they suffer in emotional ways. So, for example, they're forced, forced into pregnancy, and their young are taken from them. Now, Charlotte and I were out walking um, the doggies a couple of days ago, and I actually, for the first time, saw a calf being born on the ranch where I walk. Um, she was down, and then the calf was born, and she got up, and the little wet calf was lying there like a lump. She starts mooing and bawling and pushing that calf with her nose, that bond as she tried to bring to life this new little being. The bond that was established in that moment of birth, and as that little being stood up all crinkly and wet, and started to celebrate, and kicked its little legs and jumped in the air, and you know, within a matter of an hour, the little being was, hello world, here I am. Hi mom, I'm hungry. Right? <laughs> it's just absolutely fantastic to watch. When it's left to its own devices, the beauty of that bond, and to think how we destroy it through our exploitation by taking these cows and forcing them to be pregnant, taking their calves away at birth to steal their milk for yogurt, for ice cream, so that we can drink their milk. It's excruciatingly painful. And for piglets, we do the same thing, only they get to keep their babies longer before we <coughs> take them. But it's, it's only half, about half the natural cycle before we snatch them away. And the hens aren't even ever allowed to sit on their eggs, let alone see a chick. What kind of life is that? And this is because they're females, because they're born with a uterus, this kind of suffering. And if you look on the right there, the things there, if you see the, the, the rape racks, downed cows, gestation and farrowing crates, these are the things, the battery cages, these are the things that are really hot in the political activism we're doing because they're the most painful. They are the most egregious wrongs. And they are all directed at female animals because they are females. So I always say if there's a reasonable choice, feminists ought to be vegan and vegans ought to be feminists. But I want to be very clear, there are some people who don't have a choice. If you truly don't have a choice, then I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who look a whole lot like me and have a whole lot of privilege and can figure out how to do something different. And we can. We can do something different. And notice how much longer these females suffer because they are females. And how, how extensive, and I should put there the stats for how many eggs a hen would normally lay. It's like just a handful, like 12. <laughs> more reasonable. Chickens, of course, come from India, jungle fowl. So the question is, can we recognize this link? Can we see the wrongness of what we're doing? And can we see it in depths beyond any one form of oppression, but see this as layered and overlapping, as interconnected? Because when we see it that way, we can touch more people. We can bring more people to care. And we can say to them, I know, you're a, I know you're a feminist and I know why. But you know what? You're never going to be free until you get rid of the underlying system of oppression. 
which means you're going to have to free everybody. You're going to have to start caring about the people of color, about the cows and chickens, about the poor. You can do it, though. And you know what I say is you don't have to take them all in at once. You don't have to become a flaming activist for everything that's out there because it's exhausting doing any one. But you know what you got to do? you got to stop oppressing the other categories and speak up when you see somebody oppressing someone else from a different category. You have to say something. And be clear when you're an activist for one thing that you care about the other things, that you get that they matter, that the world is bigger. So the chickens, the turkeys, the pigs, the cows, it's all connected to classism, racism, ableism, ageism, heterosexism. And we can't solve one prob problem by itself. It won't work because of the whole idea of these underlying oppressions. We have to look bigger. And what's great about ecofeminism is it gives us a theory to do that with. It helps us to visualize and understand why. And okay, not everybody needs that. But for many of us who communicate with others, being able to explain why or how these things on the not A side are interconnected, how these systems of oppression support one another, and that we can't, uh, we can't work for just one cause. You can't hold five other things down while you're trying to free one group. It won't work. So if you care about the animals, don't be sexist. Stand up against sexism, but you've also got to stand up against other forms of oppression. You've got to speak out. And so if you honestly care, first and foremost, we have to change ourselves.